Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing in the room today? Everybody good? <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to all of those of you who are with us online as well. I just want to add my voice to all the others and say happy uh, Mother's Day to all the moms in the room. Like, we literally wouldn't be here without you guys. So thank you for that. We exist because of you. So uh, you're pretty awesome. And we hope you uh, leave here today feeling honored and encouraged. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, I, um, I'll do better next year, but today's not like a Mother's Day message. And in fact, uh, you might say, this is the opposite of Mother's Day messages. Uh, but we have some macaroons for you out as you leave, homemade, fresh made by some amazing people in the church. So you, there's that. It's manna coming down from heaven to, to you. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Um, we're in this series that we're calling Live No Lies. And just let me say this before I, I, I move on. If you're a guest with us today in the room, uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. Because like, you could literally be doing anything. And you could be any place. And the fact that you've chosen to be with us just means so very much. And we do not take it for granted. And we just want to say thank you for being here, everybody. Yeah, thank you. We started this series. By, by the way, my name is Danny Rivers, and I'm one of the pastors here. In case you forgot me, because I hadn't been here for the past two weeks. My name's Danny. Uh, I'm so glad you're here. Um, we're in this series called Live No Lies. And it's based on a book by the same title by a pastor named John Mark Comer. And it was given to me as a gift uh, last fall, maybe October. And I started reading it. And I was just blown away by stuff I know, stuff I've read, uh, but just presented in such a very intelligent way and such a creative way. And so our staff, uh, we got books for our staff, and we've been reading it together this year, and, and it's had such an impact on us. And we have some available. I think we do. We, we, we should still have some back at our, our merch area there. Every week we've sold out of it. Um, but even if we don't have it, you can get it anywhere books are sold. And um, in case you missed it, by, by the way, let me say this. Um, today is Pastor Andy's birthday. Uh, real quick, yeah, give it up for Pastor Andy back there in the back. Uh, we, um, we really appreciate uh, Pastor Andy and all that he adds to our church. There's like literally very few things that happen around here that he's not part of in some way or another. Uh, he preached an amazing message to open us, Pastor Graylin, last week. It was just such a phenomenal job. And I just want to catch you up in case you haven't been here. Um, the, the Bible and the ancients, the ancient church fathers, the writers of Scripture, talked about three enemies of the soul. For those of us who would call ourselves Christians, believers, that we have, a, we're, we're engaged in a battle of sorts um, with three enemies. And so they would talk about, and the Bible talks about it from beginning to end, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you would want to call him. Uh, immaterial, meaning he doesn't have a body like we do, but intelligent, cunning, crafty. Jesus said that he's the father of lies. And he goes on another place and says that it basically if he's got his mouth open, it, he's spewing lies and, and deceit. So there's that. And then they would talk about the flesh, which is not just our, our skin, but this, this basic instinct that we have, all of us, all of us have to do things that are not God's best for us. Does that make sense? And then they would talk about the world, and they weren't talking about the planet or the people, but they would talk about values and systems and, 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 and visions for what life should look like, social norms that get integrated into the mainstream, institutionalized, and they would say that it would come from the twin sins of rebellion against God and then the redefining um, of good and, and evil, what is good and what is not good. And so the thesis of the book is this, the devil's strategy is deceitful ideas that play to disordered desires. That's the flesh. That's the devil putting ideas out. That's the place to disordered desires that are normalized in a sinful society. So just to have it all on the same page real quick, there's deceptive ideas, the devil, disordered desires, that's the flesh, sinful society, the world. And the flesh we've spent last week and this week on because this is our real life. This is where we're living in. The, this seems like, okay, it's out there, he's out there, he's fit, but, but this is our real everyday world that we're living in, so we're spending two weeks on that, and we'll finish next week. Now, we've been, this is what we've been talking about for the past few weeks, and we've been saying there's a battle uh, for the minds of us all, a battle of ideas, 
And oftentimes we will think about it in political terms or we'll think about it in terms of people that think different. Or, but, but it's not that kind of battle. It's a spiritual battle. But it has real-world implications and ramifications. It's, it's, it's unseen. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of, of, and forces of darkness. And even if it seems like, uh, I don't know about that, it's, it's real, okay? It's real, I'm telling you. And, and the, it, it, we, we, we talked about uh, uh, ideas and assumptions, and we said that assumptions... That we, that we create in our lives, that we make in our lives, end up having a way of shaping our lives. Because the ideas we shape, that we allow into our lives, that we accept as right, uh, shape us for good or for bad, right? They change us over time. And the truth about lies is not so much that we tell lies, it's that we end up living them. And then they end up changing or shaping or determining our destiny. So there is this place in 2 Corinthians by the way, happy Mother's Day, right? You're welcome. This great Mother's Day message. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's this place in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And he's telling them, hey, listen, when somebody makes a mistake, when somebody fails in your local assemblies, you got to forgive them. You gotta, and, and then out of nowhere, he just drops this verse in, seemingly out of nowhere. He says, in order that Satan might not, say this with me, might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Interesting. That Satan might not outwit us through his cunning, through his deceptive ideas that play to disordered idea, uh, our desires. And then he says this thing, this is the key, but we are not unaware of his schemes. And what he's, Paul is saying is, Paul is saying, I am not unaware of his schemes. And Corinthian church, I don't want you to be either. Now, this is why it's important to read God's word. This is why it's important to hear biblical teaching and preaching, not because I'm up here doing some. It's just important because it, it's, about a, it's a battle of ideas. And that's why he says, I don't want you to be unaware of his schemes, that we might not get outwitted by him. Um, so today we're picking up where we left off last week, and we're talking about disordered ideas, the flesh, um, which is what the Bible calls it, and it's the sinful passions, it's the, it's the natural sort of base instincts that we have to do things that feel good, seem good, look good, smell good, taste good, whatever it is, but not, are, are not necessarily good or God's best for our lives. Um, I used to be a youth pastor for 14 years, and I would teach, about every other two or three years, I would teach a series that I taught to our students about the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And I would say to the students, and I want to say it to you as well, that it, as you're walking with Jesus... Next to Jesus, you are your own best friend in this, in this walk with Jesus. But also, I would say to them, next to the devil, you are your own worst enemy, right? Because a lot of times we blame the devil for stuff he didn't even do. Come on, can I get an amen? It was you. It was me. We decided to do these things. And that's why we're spending the time talking about the flesh. So this, this, to, to further this idea of disordered desires, the flesh, I want to talk today about freedom. And what it means and what it looks like. Because there is a freedom that God offers us and there, there's a freedom that this kind of world offers us. Now, freedom has changed over the years. 100 and, 100, 120 years ago, when people would come to the U.S. into uh, the New York's Harbor, into the Statue, they'd see the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island. They would be coming here for civil liberties, for opportunities, uh, humanitarian opportunities that they did not, were not afforded to them in wherever their home country was. And so they would think of freedom as opportunity and the right to be uh, you know, autonomous on some level, not, have, not be controlled in some ways. But over time, that notion of freedom has changed. Um, there's a professor at Notre Dame University who wrote a book, and he talks about this, and here's what he says. He says, modern freedom means, quote, the ability to do whatever you want, end quote. Right? Which seems a very American idea, right? It seems like, oh, of course. We should be able to do whatever we want. That's, that's America. But when you think about Jesus, and what he talked about freedom, when you think about the writers of the New Testament, and, and even if you don't believe in the Bible, when you look at historical philosophers, they did not think of freedom like that, like that right there. It was not defined that way. Even secular philosophers did not think of freedom in those terms. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of our New Testament, 
he would say that the ability to do whatever you want, anything and everything you want, was no kind of freedom at all. In fact, Jesus and Peter and Paul would say that that idea of doing anything you want, whatever feels good to you in the moment, will devolve eventually into a kind of slavery. Their word, not mine. It will devolve into a kind of entrapment where you become mastered by certain things. So Galatians 5 and 6 describe this better than any place. So I want to go to Galatians 5. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Here's how it starts, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then... And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So just to explain, Paul comes preaching the gospel, which is that Jesus saves and Jesus alone. But there were some teachers that came to Galatia, which is, this is the book of Galatians. And they were saying, yes, Jesus saves, but you need to add Moses. So Jesus plus Moses, my Moses, the law, the Old Testament writings, Jesus plus that will will give you freedom. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's just Jesus. It's just the cross. And he says, anybody who comes along telling you that, don't don't take it. Stand firm. And and do not let yourselves be pulled back over across the Old Testament, right? And, And by a yoke of slavery, okay? So... Trans, tr- translation, right? So, so rather, on first glance, it seems a very American thing to say, don't let anybody control you, but Paul's not finished. Verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but then notice here, there's a change, but do not use your freedom that you've just found in Christ, freedom from the restraints and the rules and the regulations of the Old Testament. Do not use your freedom to what? Indulge the flesh to do whatever you want. Rather, notice this, serve one another humbly in love. So Paul, interesting, he says, and I don't have time to dig this out too much, but he's saying the opposite of indulging the flesh is loving other people. right? Because indulging the flesh often involves us taking advantage of other people. Lust and using people to our own selfish indulgence. And he says the opposite of indulging the flesh is that, flesh is that you love other people. You put their highest interests at heart, right? So, so translation of the verse here is just because you're no longer under the Mosaic Covenant, Galatian Church, Life Point Church, don't don't um, don't give in to your disordered desires. Instead, give yourself over to the relational constraints of loving God and loving people. That's what he means, right? So. So when Paul uses the word freedom here in this text and in other places, he he uses it in the classic sort of philosophical sense of the word, which is self-determination, right? That that which makes us different, say, than the animals, like, which operate mostly by instincts that were plugged into their DNA, like, centuries and centuries and millennia ago, right? And they just act out of basic instinct. He says, you're not to live like that. You have the, because of human beings... You create in the image of God. You have, the, you, you have self-determination. You have the right to choose courses of action. Does that make sense? So, so don't think freedom means do whatever you want, which is living by basic instinct. Don't give yourself over to disorder desires. You have the ability to choose the right course of action. So Paul, drilling down further, verse 16 says, So I say... Walk by the Spirit. Now, this isn't your spirit. We all have, we are body, soul, spirit. We know that. This is not your spirit. This is, this is God's spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. Walk by the Holy Spirit, and you will not, what? Gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you have going on inside of you right now two forces, that are battling, they're contrary to each other, um, and, and they're, cur- they're constantly battling inside of you. L- literally, Paul, Paul calls them the, the, the desires of the sinful nature. The word is epithumia, and it means over-desire or inordinate desire, or, or some translators will call it covetousness, like, like a lust, like you have a, you have a coveting after something that is out of order 
with its actual importance in your life. Okay? So this is a crucial understanding. The main problem of our heart is not so much that we have desires for evil things, because most of us don't. It's that we have des over-desires for good things. Pleasure, sex, food. Come on. Got an guisada in big red. Right? <laughs> Comfort, material things, success, fame. Right? Like uh, to exalt self. Right? Which is why we call them disordered desires. Because they're not wrong in and of themselves. They're just out of order. Because what happens is Tim Keller says that the human heart is an idol factory. Meaning that we tend to make idols out of good things, good desires, uh, but have no right or no worthiness to be elevated to God-like status. But we do this all the time. We worship created things rather than the creator all the time. We do this. And, and he's talking about passions, but just be clear, desire, passions, not wrong. What, what makes them good or bad is, is their source, what is influencing them. So he says, so if out of my, if out of my flesh, my over-desires, I give in to, and do everything, anything and everything I, I want, my body wants to do, he says it will lead down a certain pathway, and the, he, he calls it the acts of the flesh. He calls it, it's going to be obvious that I'm letting flesh lead the way. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but on the other hand, he says if you, if you, if you sow to the Spirit, then there's going to be acts of the Spirit, which he calls the fruit of the Spirit, which are going to be obvious as well. You'll be able to tell. But, but in light of this, we see that there are two natures that Paul says, and, and really when you think of two natures, that seems like, what? How does that matter? I want you to think about it like this. You have two motivational systems inside of you. One is, by, is fueled by the Spirit of God. If you're a believer, you're following Jesus, there, there is a motivational system saying, come, come, come this way, follow me, trust me. But there is another motivational system that's going, no, 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 trust me, follow me, and I'll lead you. And, and so when you think flesh versus spirit, it seems like, What? Think of them as two motivational systems that are contrary to each other. So perfect, for instance, Romans uh, 7, I think it's verse 15, Paul says that I don't understand what I do. He's, what he means is I don't understand why I do what I do. He says, on the one hand, I want to do what is good, um, but he, he goes, but I don't, I don't do it. He goes, but the things that I hate, I end up doing that, right? You see? Two motivational systems operating even into the great apostle Paul. Like, I want to do the right stuff because I'm motivated by something to do the right stuff. But I'm also motivated to do the wrong thing. And sometimes I end up doing the wrong thing instead. So now the spirit and the flesh, here's the key. They both promise the same thing. What do they promise? Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So the spirit of God is saying, trust me, follow me. Uh, follow Jesus, and he will lead you to freedom. Now, freedom is human flourishing. Garden of Eden, God's best, God's best for humanity, that's freedom. But the flesh is promising the very same thing. Follow me. Like, go with your basic instincts. I promise you, we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be awesome. You're going to live your, quote, best life. But they can't both be right, everybody. Both of them are leading in very different directions, both of them promising human flourishing, freedom. One's a mirage, the other isn't, and this is where it gets real. See, the flesh, and this is what Galatians is about, will either pull you towards legalism, which is that I, if I obey all the rules and I do all the right things, then God will be pleased with me and I'll have freedom and I'll have salvation or I'll hang on to my salvation by doing a bunch of good things. And Paul will say, no, it's just a different kind of slavery. It's a different kind of bondage. So the flesh will lead me towards that, which is like, oh, I'm going to live very religiously. Or the flesh will, will go in an, a completely opposite direction and say, since Jesus is such an incredible forgiver of sin, since his grace and mercy are so awesome, I'll just sin as much as I want, live however I want, and because he's so good, he'll either forgive me or better yet, he'll bend his truth to become my truth. That's where the, the acts of the flesh will lead us towards legalism or it'll lead us towards the opposite direction, which is just live however you want. And he says that the acts of the flesh will be obvious. So one can deliver on the promise of freedom that results in human flourishing, real freedom, the other can't. 
And that mirage of the flesh, that over-desire, that inordinate desire, will have you gulping sand trying to quench your thirst. So he says, those who walk by the Spirit, they will not chase the mirage. They will know the difference between human flourishing that comes from God or the mirage that is human flourishing that comes from following after whatever your heart's desires are. And they will follow Jesus into the good and into his, his purpose for their lives. So Galatians 5 again, verse 17, for the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, the spirit what is contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with each other. And then I didn't, leave, I didn't give you this the first time. So that you are not to do whatever you want. The exact opposite of the message of our culture, which is do everything that feels good and feels right. But please hear me, and this is my opinion. You don't have to take it if you don't want. So I want to give you ideas today that you can, you don't have to agree with them, just dwell on them. Just, just because something feels good or something seems good doesn't mean that it is good. And if there's anything I would say, and again, this is my opinion, if there's anything I would say that we should not do, it's just whatever we want. In fact, I would go a step further and say this is a blatantly demonic idea to follow your heart and go wherever it decides to take you. That it's been, I know it's been normalized in our culture, but I think it leads us and it is leading us into traps that we don't even know as the nets close in around us. Proverbs 16, 25 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Praise God. Have your macaroons and head home, right? Hope they're barbecuing for you. <laughs> I want to say I'm sorry, but I got to say this stuff, all right? So now, now, let's just use a logic. Let's use logic now, okay? The issue of everybody does whatever they want to has some problems that I think are, are easy to spot. Cult, culture says you can do anything you want so long as it's legal-ish, right? And as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, right? You've heard stuff like that before, right? Now, the issue is, it sounds noble to say as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. The problem is, is it requires an agreed upon definition of harm. Because somebody will say, this is awesome, this is amazing. And another person will say, but you're harming me by doing that. And vice versa, yes or no? Right? So you'll have two opposing forces, and we see this even right now. We're saying, this is evil, no, that's evil. You're wrong, no, you're wrong. Right? Because there's no agreed upon definition uh, of what is harm. So we, we no longer believe in a sort of transcendent moral authority in the world. It's just your truth or my truth. And that devolves down to self determination or the state, meaning whatever the state decides is legal or is not legal. The problem with that is that there are all sorts of things that are legal that do not result in human flourishing. But we don't always know it. So is it legal? Is it safe? Is it culturally acceptable? Does not necessarily become the best grid through which to live our lives. The better idea is, is this wise? Is this God's best? Right? Will this lead to human flourishing or will it devolve into another kind of spiritual sla enslavement? Now, there's a problem when anyone's allowed to say which direction north is. So that if, there is, if, if everybody's allowed to decide what north is, then there is no such thing as true north. And if you know anything about navigation, you need true north to know which way to go. You, you, once you know where true north is, then you can decide where every other place is. But when 7 billion people plus are saying, I'm following my truth, you can see how that could eventually be a problem. Yes or no? Now, you don't have to be a Bible person. You don't have to believe in anything I'm saying. But you can see, logically, that's going to be a problem. Now, there was a time in Israel's history, the Israel of the Bible, of the Old Testament, where, and here's, here, I'll just tell you what it says, Judges 21. In those days, Israel had no king, no sort of central authority, and that's not even the problem. God didn't even want to give them a king because they had the law, they had the covenants, they had the Bible, they had Abraham at covenant. But in those days, they had no king, and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Now, I would call this a spirit of the age, of that age, 
but it has, it has shown up not only just those 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, but it's shown up in many, many generations following. Everybody did what was right. Now, here's the issue with that. It seems awesome that everybody was doing right. Now, 100 years before in Deuteronomy 20, Moses said, hey, listen, y'all, we can't do that. Everybody can't do what is right in their own eyes. But 100 years later, they were. Read the book of Judges when you have time. It's multi-generations of Israeli history. Chaos, disorder, dysfunction. Chapter 20, civil war. Pain. People were harming each other because there was no moral transcendent authority. And in every culture, everybody, listen, every culture where everybody does what is right in their eyes, oh, go study, let's go historical now, not hysterical, but let's go historical with it. Think Greece, think Rome, Roman Empire, think Greece. You can go further back into the other, the Babylonian Empire, wherever people were doing whatever was right in their own eyes, inevitably it involved the culture collapsing. The society collapses in on its own self when individual rights, liberties, whatever, all of these things, which we love and we take for granted here in our country, but when everybody's doing it right in their own eyes, historically, it does not end well anywhere. And this is what was happening in Judges. When people decide to detach themselves from God's rules and God's laws and God's government, which Isaiah says of it, the increase of his government, there shall, need, shall be no end. But when individuals and when nations and when cities and when countries, when they detach themselves from the rule of God in their lives, problems arise. So when the United States was being formed, they had in mind Greece, they had in mind Rome, they d adopted much of their ideas. But a guy named Edmund Burke comes along in 1791. And here's what he says. He says, men and women are qualified for moral liberties in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own fleshly appetites. Not religious, secular. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men and women of intemperate minds cannot be free because their passions forge their fetters. Their freedom to do whatever they want will inevitably devolve into it becoming a kind of trap to them. Fetters are chains meant to hinder movement. So all that to say that what the world calls freedom is what Jesus and the New Testament writers would call slavery and vice versa, what Jesus and the New Testament writers would call slavery, the world would call freedom. But we can't both be right. Disordered desires often produce unintended consequences. So Tim Keller said in another place, he said that Liberty is not the absence of constraints. It's choosing the right constraints. Loving God, loving people. Jesus would say in John 8, 34, he says, Very truly I tell you that anyone who sins, and he doesn't talk about a moral lapse. He's talking about anybody who chooses a life of sin is a slave to that sin. Meaning, just meaning that there may come a time where they say, I don't want to do this anymore, but they won't be able to of their own volition, by their own willpower, escape it. Which is why he goes two verses later and says, but you all will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And in another place he would say, Jesus would say, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Now, I know that it's 2022. I know that I'm 50 years old, and some people will say uh, this idea of sin, this idea of, of whatever, what you're saying, Danny, is old and tired and worn out moralism. Okay, okay, I can, I, okay. But I want, you to, I want you to consider something. What if the boundaries that God sets up in his word to govern human life and the way we live our lives what if they are not about restricting freedoms or liberties, but are about protecting people from harm and creating environments where humans can actually flourish? What if in the same way loving parents like you set up boundaries with your children, not to restrict their fun, but to keep them safe from harm? And, and, and what if when God says no, or when God says not yet, or when God says not now, what if the boundaries are set out of a loving God who created us in our innermost being, in, God, in our mother's womb, 
who knows us better than anybody else and who formed us and has our best interest at heart? What if? And what if ignoring said boundaries results in human pain and misery and chaos and dysfunction and the lack of God's best? So maybe what I'm saying is tired old moralism or maybe there's a point to all of it. See, it's not so much that we don't have the freedom to do and live however we want to. For the most part, we do. But here's the thing about our actions and the decisions that we make in life. There is a law at work. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not doesn't change the fact that it exists and it's real. And it's called the law of returns, or in biblical parlance, it's called the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest says about our actions and our decisions that we make that we reap what you sow. Meaning that if I put corn in the ground, it doesn't matter if I hope to get green beans, I'm going to get corn. Come on, if, come on. It doesn't matter if I want some pinto beans to go with my carnizada. If I put corn in the ground, I'm going to get elotes. <laughs> it's going to be delicious when we put some mayo on it and some chili. Come on, and some lime. Come on, everybody. And a little cotija, cheese in there. Mmm. I think I'm done. Right, I'll see you guys later. Let's take it off. It's Mother's Day. You get what you sow. But listen, that's not it. That's not the end of the law of the harvest. You reap more than you sow. Meaning, I don't put a corn of ground expecting to get one kernel back. I expect to get a, bu- a tree or a bush that's going to have multiples. But, but it doesn't just stop there. I reap long after I sow. Meaning there are often long-term unintended consequences that happen much later than after I sowed the seed to begin with. To the extent that I could think that I've sowed the seed in the ground and I'm fine, everybody. I know that this is different than what God's word says and whatever Danny or whoever says. And we think I got away with that. It's not really a thing. There's a delay to the harvest. The things we do, do something to us. So every time I sow to the flesh or, or I give in to the flesh's desire to do what God would say, hey, that's not God's best for you, sin, whatever you want to call it. We plant something in the soil of our hearts, which then begin to take root, be, which begin begin to grow and eventually yield a harvest of a deformed nature. But the same is true of the Spirit. If I sow to the Spirit then I'm going to reap over time a harvest that, that produces the character of Christ in me or a conformed nature. So to the flesh, deformed nature. So to the spirit, inevitably, eventually, conformed nature into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? It's good news and bad news. Bad news is that when my flesh leads the way, when my desire is to do anything I want, because that's what I think freedom is, that's where I think human flourishing comes from. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. This is the next few verses. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Back, back it up just a second. I'm not going to talk about all of these. I want to talk about one, though. One set. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. These are attitudinal things, right? They're attitudes of heart. So, so let, me just say, let me just talk about these. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage... Twitter, come on, everybody, right? If, you know, if you're on there, you know that's true, right? Cancel culture, all of the news, come on, fits of rage, and right? What I'm saying is these are destructive attitudes so that where the flesh is allowed to thrive and do its work instead of the spirit, what happens is it divides people. It tends to separate us, and then subsequently marriages break up. And friendships die, and communities die, and families break up, and churches die, and they, they lose their ability to heal people the way God designed them to be. 
and love between people ceases to flow and animosity and division reigns. Wherever the flesh is allowed to go over time, its seed produces a harvest that is more than we intended and comes along later than we intended. And it comes out and it pollutes all of us in communities and nations and, and cities and families that are governed by the flesh. It shows us division is created. Historically, division, separation of people, animosity grows wherever the flesh is allowed to do whatever it wants to do. Paul says the works of the flesh are obvious. You can just tell, right? You, you, can, you can deny, you can suppress or bend the truth, but we're just sort of guilty as charged when any of this stuff shows up in our lives. But he says that the same is true of the Spirit. That anybody who sows to the Spirit, they're going to have, he calls, what the, he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. It's obvious as well. It's, it's love and joy and peace and forbearance or patience kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. If we look at a list like this, comparing it to the last list, the works of the flesh produce this, the work of the Spirit produces this, and we say, what would it look like if I were more loving and less angry all the time? What, what, what would it look like if I had real joy in spite of circumstances? And what would it look like if I had peace so that I could sleep throughout the whole night and not wake up worried and panicked about things? And what happens if I had, what would happen if I had patience so that I could just wait on God to provide instead of forcing and manipulating and moving? What would happen if, I was more kind. I had more goodness that was intrinsic because of the Spirit of God, the new nature of God coming out of me. Faithfulness, and gentleness. What if I could actually control my own urges and my own instincts? I read this in the book, and I just want to read a little bit of it to you. Our strongest desires are not actually our deepest desires. Meaning, in the moments of temptation to do what, whatever I feel like doing, that raging fire uh, to make a condescending comment towards a coworker or buy another pair of shoes or whatever that I don't really need or to overeat or overdrink or to lust or ignore God or watch Netflix again instead of reading my Bible. Like... When it feels overwhelming, that urge, and almost irresistible, um, those desires, listen to me, they don't come from the deepest place that is in you. If you were to get quiet before God in those moments where you feel it urges to do whatever, if you were to take some deep breaths and let the deepest desires of your heart come to the surface, what is it that you want? What is it that you really want? My guess is that you want to be more like God. You want to be closer to God. My guess is you want more of this and less of that. My guess is the deepest place of you, you would say, man, I wish I loved people better. And I wish I had more joy I wish I had more patience. I wish I, wish I had more peace. And, and, and do you know what human nature does? And it's this pull of the flesh, even when we have good intentions, which are I want to be more like this and less like that. What we will do is we will say, I'm going to make a plan. You know, he's, he's got some good points. I don't agree with everything he said, but he's got some good points. I'm going to make a plan to go from, from A to B. And I'm going to try really hard, but that's called religion. And Paul will tell us all the way through the book of Galatians, it'll fail every time. Because willpower is incredible for diet and exercise. Clearly, I don't have much. You didn't have to laugh that loud, man. Come on, man. Or shame on me. But willpower against an addiction? Willpower against triggered trauma because of somebody did horrific things to you as a child? 
willpower against the rejection of a father, a father wound or a mother wound? You're going to need more than willpower, everybody. And that's why we need an ally. That's why we need something bigger than us, stronger than us, and that's the Holy Spirit of God in his, our lives. So Paul says, verse 24, that those who belong to Christ Jesus have, say it with me, crucified the sin, put to death the sinful nature with its passions and its desires. So Paul says, listen, you can't play with this. You can't accommodate sin. You can't say, I'm going to just sin a little bit because every time we do that, we're planting a seed in the ground and it reproduces after its own kind, but it produces way more than we ever meant for it to and it happens a lot later than we thought it was going to. You reap what you sow. You got to put it to death. And then he says, because it's not going to just lead, if you don't put it to death, it's not going to just lead to a kind of spiritual slavery. You're going to take it up a notch. He says, don't be deceived. This is chapter 6. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And whoever sows to please their flesh, from that flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit, however, good news, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Two systems, both promising freedom and fl human flourishing, but one is a mirage. And it will inevitably produce slavery and destruction. And the other will produce human flourishing and better yet, eternal life. So how do I do this, Danny? Glad you asked. Glad I'm way over my time. Since we live by the Spirit, verse 25, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, well, I don't even know what that means. Okay, okay, okay. Jesus, while he was walking this earth, he laid down habits, practices that he himself participated in. Early in the morning, it would say, Jesus would go out to a lonely place and pray. He would, he went out into the wilderness and he didn't eat anything for, for 40 days and 40 nights. He's not asking you to do the same. The disciples run into a situation where they're trying to cast out an evil spirit, but they can't. And they say, what did we do? What did we do wrong? How do we do this? And Jesus says, hey, listen, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. Your willpower won't work on this. So we, we open ourselves up to prayer, to fasting, to confession. Meaning, James 5.16, confess your sins to one another that you might be healed. We, we have groups and, and life with other believers and we're, we're in accountability relationships with them. And he says, when we do this, we open our hearts and open our minds to the Spirit of God, to keep in step with the Spirit. It's like this, last thing, promise, promise. We used this before. Think about a rowboat, a canoe, a kayak, whatever you, you got. It requires what? Human effort to move it, Right? However fast you can paddle, that's how fast you'll go. However slow, however tight, you get a cramp, you fall out, you're in trouble. But think about a sailboat. It's a beautiful thing, sailboat. I tried it once. Don't trust me to sail you anywhere straight. <laughs> you open up a sail, and what do you need? Something other than outside of you, the wind. And sometimes it'll blow you fast, and sometimes it'll blow you slow. John, uh, J Jesus says in John 3 to Nicodemus, he says, um, so it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. He says, the Spirit is like the wind. Nobody can tell where it's coming. Nobody, no, nobody can tell where it goes. It, the wind blows wherever it wants. And so it is with it, everyone who's born of God, he says. So we open up the wind of God in prayer and in worship and in, in community and through, the, through immersing ourselves in the Scriptures. And we say, God, I have this pool inside of me to do this and that and the other thing, and I want to do it, and it feels right. But God, if you'll help me, if you'll blow this, the wind into my sails, I'll go where you tell me. And you'll lead and you'll guide me. And when I don't know what to do, your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my pathway. And I'll always know what to do 
because the wind of God, as I open it up in prayer and worship, the wind of God fills the sail and the wind blows me wherever I'm supposed to go. Two motivational systems trying to lead us to a path. One's a mirage. It will never get you where you think it's going to go. The other one's true and right and will lead and guide you all the way to eternal life, everybody. Just think about it, would you? Would you think about it? Those of you online, would you just think about it? You don't have to agree with me. Just think about it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the word of the Lord. I pray that wherever my words have failed or I have fallen short or I didn't make it clear that your, your, your spirit would illuminate, your word would show people the way. I pray for clarity, God, for people to have clarity, to be led by the spirit of God, to keep in step with the spirit of God, to open themselves up by following the practices that you laid down for us, Jesus. I pray that we be led and guided by not our instincts, not by what seems right, not by what culture says, not by what's popular. God, we're not at war with people. We're not at war with in, in a political world. I know that people want to make it that, but this is way bigger than that. It's spiritual, Lord. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against forces of darkness, against spirits, the Bible says in Ephesians. And I just pray that you would make us spiritual, that you would help us to become more and more and more like Jesus and less and less and less like this world. May we grow in kindness and grow in grace and grow in gentleness and grow in love and grow in joy and grow in peace and grow in patience and grow in, in uh, self-control. Let, let the Spirit of God be formed in us, O oh God. Conform us into the image of your Son, Jesus. Make us more like you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, uh, just before I let you go, two couple things. If you want to know about what it looks like to follow Jesus, we have a booklet we'd love to put in your hands, free of charge. Those of you online, same deal, just let us know. It's called Following Jesus. We'd love to put that in your hands. Maybe baptism is the next step. That's next week. Uh, I want to say two other things. We have two brand new teams on our, in our church that, are, that have been formed that are operating here. I'm not going to ask them to identify themselves. We have a safety team, which are people here who have medical training. And if anything happens here or with our kids or anywhere, they're, they're trained to respond. And, and then we have a security team of people who are just making sure we're safe. We have officers out there. We have other people here. And I just want to say thank you to them. That's, it, that's hard work. It's, we, they don't even get to be seen most of the time. So I just want to say thank you to all of you guys who are doing that. Thank you. It, last thing, if, if you want to give today, you can do that at lifepointsa.com slash give. You can do it out in the lobby. But here's the most important thing I want to tell you. When you do this, you're not giving to LifePoint. You're giving through LifePoint. You enable us to do so many things, one of which is just this right here. We support uh, Ima's home in the Philippines. They have a beautiful building that has 121 children in it right now. And you're providing much of their, I think it's about a third of their operating budget every year, every month. It's coming right from you. But also, right now we're building this new building. It doesn't look like much yet. Uh, it has another part that goes that way too. But when this building is done, it's going to house uh, an additional uh, 300 children. Uh, this building, when it's all, it's, it's much bigger than this. It's ongoing right now. I'm going to show it to you as it comes along. Um, and we're going to have almost 400 children that we can house there for food, clothing, medication, education, and most importantly, we're going to teach them about Jesus. And uh, whenever you give, real things are happening in other parts of the world. And I just wanted you to see that because sometimes you think, whatever, I'm just throwing money here or there. No, 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 no. People's lives are being changed, okay? Kids' lives are being changed because of you. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you so very much. Okay, would you stand with me real quick? Bump a fist, high five, elbow, kick, uh, whatever. God bless you. God ha be with you. Mama's have an amazing, amazing day. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. God bless. Have a, have, we love you. Have a great day. God bless.